Hello, everyone. Oh, welcome back from lunch. We've got two panels or two sessions to go. They do include some panel sessions, so I'm not getting too far ahead of myself. Uh, in this session, we have got four company presentations followed by a panel session. And in the other auditorium, if you're at all interested in ESG considerations in public mineral reporting, is it any of you? If you are, you're to rush madly across to the second uh, auditorium. That's okay. We know what we're in for here at the moment. And we're actually going to lead off with a fellow that has got quite a reputation. He was a trailblazer in the lithium industry, and now he is a trailblazer in salt battery technology. You've probably heard of him before. His name is Iggy Tan. He's currently got three ongoing projects, and he's here today to tell us the story of all tech batteries. Welcome to the Batteries of the Future report. There are some real downsides to today's lithium iron batteries, stumbling blocks that are the focus of international discussion. The batteries can overheat through thermal runaway, which can result in devastating fires and explosions. They operate best in a fairly narrow temperature range between 15 and 35 degrees Celsius. And the lifespan of lithium iron batteries is limited to between seven and 10 years, depending on their application. On top of that, lithium ion battery manufacturers are at the mercy of both supply and pricing of a range of critical metals. Take lithium, for example. It's the most critical component of a lithium ion battery, and the price has jumped sixfold since the start of this year, 2022, adding upwards pressure to production costs. Add to that, cobalt is considered the greatest material supply chain risk for the industry in the short to medium term, and whilst the Democratic Republic of Congo produces about 70% of the world's supply, human rights abuses continue to raise ethical concerns. There are also supply chain concerns around graphite and copper, which make up the anode part of the battery. The industry is heavily reliant on China because it produces 90% of all graphite anode material. Therein lies geopolitical risk. A standard electric vehicle requires two and a half times more copper than a standard internal combustion vehicle. A recent report suggests there aren't enough copper mines being built or expanded to provide all the copper needed to produce electric vehicles into the future. But an alternative does exist. The solution is Altec Chemical Serenergy Battery, which uses sodium alumina solid state technology. So you probably spent a lot of nights wondering this question. What is the future of grid storage batteries? But before I talk about that, I want to talk to you about solid state technology. Who understands solid state technology? The industry, the lithium industry has been trying to move to solid state technology. And in a lithium <clears throat> battery, there is a positive terminal and a negative terminal, the anode and the cathode. And in between that, there is a liquid electrolyte, which is flammable. There is also a plastic separator, which is also flammable. And that is causing the problems with battery fires. And that's why the industry is trying to remove that flammable material and replace it with solid state technology. So solid state technology is essentially a ceramic piece that allows the lithium ions to transfer back and forth. As in the video, you can see the problems with battery fires and explosions. That is essentially thermal runaway. And it may be caused by overheating, physical damage, or overcharging. But when it takes off, it's nearly impossible to put out a lithium ion battery fire. Why is that the case? Because it generates oxygen at the cathode end of the battery. So in a normal fire, you douse the fire, take the oxygen away and you put the fire out. In a lithium ion battery, it generates oxygen. So that's one of the major problems with that. The other thing is that a lot of people don't realize lithium ion batteries only operate in a narrow temperature range. So down to about 15 degrees to 35 degrees. 
When you get down to zero degrees, actually your battery operates at 70% capacity. So that's a problem. The other issue is that lithium degrades every time you charge and discharge a battery. There are side reactions. And so generally a, a, a battery lasts for eight to 10 years uh, in the EV sector or the grid storage sector. Now, I know there's uh, lithium companies in here and they love the, the price of lithium shooting up fivefold in the, in the last couple of years. But this has put a lot of pressure on the lithium iron battery industry. The other main concern is the, the ethical concerns of cobalt supply. So 70% of cobalt comes from the Republic of Congo and there are child labor issues and the industry is concerned about those. Finally, 90% of graphite is actually supplied by one country around the world. So 90% of graphite comes from China and it rep represents a geopolitical risk for the industry. Copper is the final puzzle. Two and a half times copper is used in a, a electric vehicle compared to an ICE vehicle. And there's a recent report that said there's not enough copper mines being developed to even meet the electric vehicle demand going forward. So is there a battery that actually is totally fireproof, has a life of beyond 15 years, operates in a large temperature range, has no lithium, no cobalt, no graphite, no copper, and no manganese? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Serenergy battery, a sodium chloride salt battery was developed by the Fraunhofer Battery Institute out of Germany. They've spent nearly 35 million euros in research and development, another 25 million euros in pilot plan work, and they were looking for a partner to commercialize it. And we are, we are that partner. So number one, Remember I said the, the flammable liquid, our batteries are solid state technology. So we don't have a flammable liquid. We use a ceramic tube as the solid electrolyte. So there's no thermal runaway. It is totally safe. It doesn't generate oxygen at the cathode end. So totally fireproof. Number two, it operates at a wide temperature range. It can operate down to minus 40 degrees. Why? It's because we don't have that liquid electrolyte and it also has its internal temperature. So it operates at 270 degrees on the inside of the battery. It's fully insulated, you can touch it, but that's like a mammal. It regulates its own temperature. So you can, go, you can operate this battery in really cold climates. Because we don't have the liquid electrolyte, it's solid state technology, the sodium ions don't break down. So we have more than 15 years life of this battery. So we use sodium ions, which is in salt. And if you know your periodic table, sodium is just under lithium. And it's actually a very reactive material. And common salt is already available, it's cheap. And that's one of the big advantages. We also don't have cobalt. Well, chemistry doesn't require cobalt to have the, the power of the battery. It's very similar to the lithium iron phosphate battery. So we're really not exposed to the, co the cobalt supply chain. And finally, it hasn't got an anode. It's a self-forming anode. So we don't have graphite and we don't have copper. So that's a, a, a real big advantage. So let me talk about the chemistry. It's really neat technology. So essentially we have a ceramic tube. That's the solid state electrolyte. We add salt to it and nickel metal powder. And, uh, and that essentially is the, the cathode end of the battery. It then sits in a, a metal cylinder and that cylinder acts as the negative part of the battery. Now the batteries are 250 watts. And, and essentially, that's what it looks like. The ceramic bit sits into the, the, the metal canister. Now, this is how what happens when you charge the battery. 
The sodium ions migrate through the ceramic piece. It leaves the chloride behind and the nickel grabs the chloride and becomes nickel chloride. The sodium forms on the other side of the battery as molten sodium. And when you discharge the battery, it dissolves away. So it's a self-forming anode. And this is what it looks like. When you charge, it forms an anode. When you discharge, it dissolves the anode. So that's why we don't have to have graphite or copper on the anode part of the battery. And this is when it's discharging. The sodium ions go back, grabs the chloride ions, and becomes salt again. Well, how does this battery stack up with other batteries? If you look at lithium ion phosphate battery or the sodium or the redox flow battery, uh, it's very similar energy density to lithium ion phosphate batteries, uh, very similar energy conversion, but no maintenance costs, much safer and lower capital costs. If you look at the curve of where they, these batteries sit, uh, you can see the lithium ion battery on the left hand side are, are cobalt nickel batteries, lots of power. And the bottom part of that is more energy. So not necessarily a lot of power. Our batteries sit in the middle of that. All right. The batteries that we're going to produce are only destined for the grid storage market. We're not interested in the EV market. It's overcrowded. The grid storage is the market you want to look for. It's a very early stage market. But as my friend Joe Lowry said in his presentation, the grid storage market is going to grow 20 times in this decade. So we're ready to commercialize this. This is some of the vision of the pilot plant that was built by the Fraunhofer Institute out of Germany. Uh, and they have produced these batteries and they're operating. So it's not an R&D program. It's actually been produced and performing. Our job is to commercialize it and build the first 100 megawatt battery plant in Germany. Okay, so part of the technology is mixing the alumina powder to make that ceramic tube. The key technology is to making that ceramic tube that allows the sodium to go through. It's like creating channels within that. So this is the 100 megawatt project in Saxony, Germany. Saxony is actually the east part of Germany on the border of Poland. Uh, and you can see there's a lot of development there with uh, automakers and so on. And this is actually what our 100 megawatt plant would look like. And you can notice on the, on the roof of that are all solar panels. So essentially we are generating our own power and a, it'll be a totally green project. So what's the cost of the batteries? The Fraunhofer Institute have estimated it should be 40% cheaper to make these batteries. Well, it sort of makes sense, right? We don't have lithium, we don't have copper, we don't have cobalt, we don't have manganese, we don't have graphite. So it sort of makes sense. Our first product is actually a 60 kilowatt battery. It contains about 240 of these cells, about uh, 600 volts. And, and this is our initial product. What's unique about this is there are five shelves and there are no moving parts. Now, what's the problems of the grid storage market today is there is an extensive time to install these batteries. It's complex to put 20 of these batteries on site to configure it up. The noise on the cooling fans of these batteries is a problem. It takes a lot of valuable space and it requires a, a lot of regular maintenance. So at Alltech, we've solved this problem and we we'll, Last week, we launched this. In a breakthrough for battery technology, Australian company Alltech Batteries has launched a design for a one megawatt hour sodium chloride Serenergy battery pack destined for the renewable energy storage market. The product, called Grid Pack, uses an innovative new sodium chloride battery technology. 
One of the unique features of these batteries is that there are no moving parts such as cooling fans like in lithium ion battery packs. They're totally silent and can be installed close to residential neighbourhoods. These innovative batteries can even function in extreme temperatures from frigid cold to scorching desert heat. They also have a lifespan of over 15 years. That's nearly double a lithium ion battery. The plug and play feature of the site installation for the grid packs ensures that they can be easily installed in remote locations. Additionally, the containers have been designed to be stackable, which minimizes the battery footprint. So, ladies and gentlemen, within five minutes of arriving at your site, we can have one megawatt of battery connected to your grid in five minutes. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> It is compelling, isn't it? And that's one of the things that we're giving you things to think about at this conference as well, not just uh, opportunities to invest, but to really think about the ways that we could change the future and our energy, the way that we meet our growing energy requirements. Keith Coughlin, how are you down there, sir? You want to come up and join me? This is Keith, everyone. Keith is from European Metals Holdings, and we're going to talk about European Metals a development of the Cinevec project, which is in the Czech Republic. It's the largest hard rock lithium resource in Europe. And Keith is the executive chairman of the company. He's got more than 30 years of mining uh, finance and advising resource companies on projects covering most metals and most uh, commodities in many, uh, many uh, different uh, jurisdictions. So he's had a, a pretty big career. He was responsible for actually finding and acquiring this project on behalf of Euro European metals it's a while ago. This is almost your 10 year anniversary. So what's happened and where are we going? Would you please make him very welcome? Thank you. Thank you very much, Chrissy. Yes, so lithium in Europe is what I want to talk to you about, but just want to touch on the lithium market a little before I do that. And it's a market that, you know, if you're if you're not deep in it and you just read things from time to time, it's easy to get confused. It's a fairly opaque market and there's a little bit of misinformation out there. So it pays to just remember to, or touch on some hard numbers from time to time. Uh, first quarter this year, EV numbers have been released just in the last few days. And there's a stark message in that and a message that pertains directly to supply and demand of lithium and therefore the price of it, at least for the, the next year or so. So BYD, Chinese company, largest EV manufacturer in the world, First quarter results this year, year on year up 83%. That is 83% more vehicles than they made this quarter last year. Tesla up 61%. So there's going to be 14 million electric vehicles made in the world this calendar year. That's up 33%, three and a half million more vehicles than last year. Uh, Tesla and BYD will account for about 2 million of those. So that, that's a significant increase and therefore a significant increase in the amount of lithium that needs to be consumed in the world to power those electric vehicles. And, and more importantly than that, perhaps, is that now we're seeing Ford, GM, these more mainstream, more traditional auto manufacturers starting to hit big numbers. So GM will make 150,000 vehicles this year, which is small compared to those Tesla and BYD numbers, but that's up 284% on last year at 39,000. So the increase is what's important. And Ford, for example, have uh, anticipated that by 2030, they'll make 2 million electric vehicles a year. So the lithium market, lithium metal is in deficit. It will remain in deficit for many years. And that goes towards long-term lithium pricing. Let me talk a little about our project specifically. So we're in Europe, in the Czech Republic, this is a great place to be for a couple of reasons. Firstly, the growth in demand for lithium in Europe is faster than anywhere else in the world for the foreseeable future. And there is no lithium produced in Europe. So huge demand, no supply. The project itself, it's an integrated, fully integrated project. So you may have heard some other presentations of lithium companies over the past two days, mainly spodumene, concentrate, companies that produce a concentrate and send it on for further uh, processing. We're going all the way through to battery grade chemical. We've produced both battery grade lithium hydroxide and battery grade lithium carbonate, and we maintain the flexibility to supply either of those into the market. It's a very, very large resource, fourth largest hard rock lithium resource in the world. 
as I mentioned, the largest hard rock lithium resource in Europe. But more importantly, it's by far the largest hard rock lithium resource in the EU. That's a very important distinction because of the commitment now from the European Union to, to building this industry. The, we have very compelling economics, as you can see here, about 2 billion of after-tax US dollars, after-tax MPV. These numbers were calculated a year and a half ago using a lithium hydroxide price of 17,000 a tonne. That's one seven. It's been, since then, it's been closer to 80,000 and, and now it's above 50,000. So that would clearly have a significant impact on these project economics. We have a couple of very strong partnerships. CHES, our in-country partner, is the Czech National Power Utility. Uh, and the project has very, very good ESG credentials. I'll talk a little more about Europe and the commitment I mentioned. So the Europeans committed at the start of COVID a trillion euros to the green energy deal, that is the green energy transition. And I've got mentioned there the Just Transition Fund. This just gives you an idea of what sort of money the EU is making available to help put projects like ours into production, just a, a quite $40 billion in uh, euros into the Just Transition Fund which I'll talk more about in a moment. So the Europe, European Union is fully committed to a battery industry, fully committed to an electric vehicle future without any production of critical raw materials to enable that. And what's been happening in other parts of the world as we've seen, particularly recently with Biden announcing the, the um, Inflation Reduction Act and a commitment to provide significant funding and policy updates to, to this industry, specifically to lithium, the Europeans are all of a sudden behind the eight ball. They've responded with this Critical Raw Materials Act, which is in draft form right now, should be final policy by the end of May. And this Critical Raw Materials Act is designed to redress the imbalance that they see globally in helping fund projects exactly like ours. I mentioned the Just Transition Fund. We have been pre-approved for a 50 million euro grant from the Just Transition Fund. And in receiving that grant, we've had the project uh, designated as a strategic project at, in Brussels. So that designation, I believe, will help us significantly when the final Critical Raw Materials Act legislation is passed. And it it's specifically says in there that strategic projects will be enabled for shorter permitting periods and more public funding. So I think we're in the right part of the world right now. This is why they're taking this approach. So map of Europe and all the battery factories getting built in the region. Sinovets is the gold star you can see right in the middle of all of this action. The Critical Raw Material Act specifically says that Europe wants at least 10% of all the, the metals consumed uh, in, in the energy transition to be mined in Europe. Now, Fraunhofer Institute suggests that that's about 120 to 130,000 tonnes per annum of battery grade lithium chemicals. That's up from a zero base. So this is a, a very ambitious goal by the EU. It's going to be difficult to get there, but it simply can't get there unless projects like ours come into production and come into production quickly. A map of where we are, uh, just on the top end of that big blue dot, which is the project, is the German-Czech border. Uh, and then the smaller blue dot south of there is our processing plant. Uh, I, this map is interesting in as much as it shows all of the historic brown coal pits in the area. Now, the region is moving away from coal towards green energy, and that's very helpful for us because we'll be helping to rehabilitate these brown coal pits with our tailings. We'll be taking out-of-work coal miners and uh, training them to become lithium miners. And that's one of the reasons why we've been identified by the Just Transition Fund um, for, for that grant that I mentioned earlier. So Sinovitz accounts for over 65% of all of the hard rock resources in the EU. This is very important because when the European Union wants to support projects, wants to bring projects on, Obviously, we're foremost in their mind, having by far the largest project, and we believe that that will assist us greatly in getting the permitting and the funding in place to come into production quickly. We, yeah, this, this is our most recent test work from an optimised flow sheet that we announced in October of last year, just demonstrating the ability to produce very pure lithium chemicals. And, and as I say, the, uh, the, the flexibility to produce both of the key battery chemicals. This is that flow sheet itself. I'll move a little quickly, but uh, demonstrating how simple that flow sheet 
It's low cost, low CO2 footprint compared with other hard rock processes. And I'll talk about those ESG credentials in a moment. In fact, now. So one of, one of the keys with Cinevets and our partner Ches is the Czech National Power Utility. They've committed to providing solar power to the project. This has a massive impact on our potential carbon footprint. They already have that solar power in, in, in place. In fact, they have four times more solar currently in place than the project will need. That's just one of a number of uh, credentials that are positive from an ESG point of view. Sinovitz is a historic underground tin mine. Tin has been mined here off and on for nearly 600 years. It was last mined when the wall came down in 1989. But re-entering a historic underground mine, you can imagine, has a much lower impact on, on the community and on the environment than trying to start a greenfield site. So that's very handy for us from an ESG perspective. Minviro is a, a global consultant in this space. They produce the, this uh, LCA, which stands for Life Cycle Assessment for us about 18 months ago, demonstrating in this case, the, the GWP, the global warming potential, or what we used to call carbon footprint. You can see that they've given us two bar charts here. The first uh, much larger one is if we did have to power the project using the local uh, dirty brown coal, which we're not doing. And the second, you can see the impact of pro providing green energy to the project, what it has on our, um, on our CO2 footprint. The other two key measurements that these people use, one is acidification because Spodumene concentrate conversion is very highly acid consumptive. We score very well on acidification and also water usage because the South American brines use a lot of water. This project uses very little water as well. So very good ESG credentials across the boards. Uh, I mentioned strategic partnership with CHES, the, the uh, Czech National Power Utility. We also have a, an official European Union body, uh, a, a formal uh, arrangement with them, the EIT, just moving a little quicker. I mentioned some numbers at the top of the presentation. So these are our most recent formal numbers. And unfortunately, they're, they're about 14, 15 months old now. So at, after tax NPV, US dollars of 2 billion, as I say, based on 17,000 price of lithium hydroxide, where it's now north of, of 50,000. Uh, interestingly here, we could produce on these numbers at one uh, one ton of battery grade lithium hydroxide net of our tin credits for about five and a half thousand US dollars a ton. So you compare that with any re reasonable lithium price you want to use, and you can see the project has um, a very significant chance of being highly highly profitable. So top part of this slide is what we've done to date. The bottom part is what has to be done between now and final investment decision. We're deep into our definitive feasibility study being done by DRA Global. That will be uh, available September, October of this year, and then moving straight to um, a final investment decision. We're currently doing lock cycle test work on that optimised flow sheet that I mentioned earlier at Nagrom in Perth. Preliminary results from that are very good. Uh, from that work, we'll also have product samples that we will be able to distribute to potential off-takers for them to do their own qualifications on. But we hope to be in our final investment decision towards the end of this year. That will partially depend on what comes out of the Critical Raw Materials Act. We are looking for things like uh, speeding up timelines in the permitting process. Europe is traditionally a little slow compared with places like Australia and Canada, for example, uh, but we do believe we're going to see that and it has been specifically stated in that draft legislation. Theme we're putting together, so some of these people are based in Perth with me, uh, others in the Czech Republic, some in London. This is, this is a very big project. We're pulling together a team from all across the world. It's very difficult to find uh, high quality people with lithium, specific lithium experience these days because the market is so busy. We've been uh, we're very happily, uh, Mark Rowley and Walter Modal down there on the bottom line, significant lithium experience, great to have them involved. Our partner Chairs uh, employs 35,000 people in country. So at that level, we have no problems, uh, but putting together a world-class team to develop this world-class asset. So in short, we're developing the largest hard rock lithium resource in the part of the world where the, the demand is going to be greater than anywhere else in the world. We, we're online with the, with the EU, with the policymakers and with the government. We're very much looking forward to moving this project forward uh, dramatically in 2023. Thank you for your time.
Thanks very, thanks very much, Ken. Blackstone Minerals is next up on stage. An Australian-based battery mineral material developer focused on building an integrated mining and refining business in Vietnam. They've made some very impressive technical advancements in the last financial year, and I heard they've been recognised for their efforts by the ATO, the Australian Taxation Office, with a massive tax refund to be put back into the business. Now, we heard a little bit about Blackstone earlier on in the day, if you were here for the panel discussion a little bit earlier on. Scott Williamson is their MD, standing here in front of us now, and he was one of the experts that was discussing operating in uh, the Asia-Pacific region in general and some of the, the things that they discovered through lived experience. But he's here now solely to focus on Blackstone. Will you please make him very welcome? Thanks, Chrissy. I just want to congratulate the team at Vertical Events, Tribeca and Argonaut for what is a, a great conference and yeah, really looking forward to what this conference can be over the coming years. So congratulations, everyone. Um, so yeah, yeah, we're looking to restart the previously operating Ben Phuc nickel mine. We're in Northern Vietnam. So you can see there the previous owners sunk over $100 million into the capital infrastructure. We're looking to restart the mine, but more importantly, we're looking to build a downstream refining business that produces the chemical products for the lithium ion battery. So it's a vertically integrated uh, mining and refining strategy um, using the abundant hydroelectric power that we have in Northern Vietnam region. We've got a globally relevant nickel sulfide district and a large scale nickel sulfide resource and reserve. We're looking at first quartile cost position um, with, with the lowest carbon footprint nickel in the industry. And we're going to do this through a partnership model uh, with the downstream end users, particularly focused on lithium ion battery and electric vehicle partners. And we've done a lot of work in South Korea where the major players include groups like LG, uh, Samsung and Hyundai. Uh, just a quick corporate snapshot. So cash positions uh, just down a little bit lower, around $16 million. Um, market cap uh, well below. The PFS uh, MPVs were um, multiple billions of dollars um, we have in this project. So we've been trading lower because um, the market doesn't believe we'll be able to fund the capital requirement. And we're pretty confident that that funding will come from the downstream end users. Um, very supportive shareholder base. We've got Fidelity, one of the largest institutions in the world. Um, very supportive. Um, Deutsche Balaton out of Germany. So I've got some really strong institutional investors. Nanja out of Hong Kong. Uh, Echo Pro and board and management also with 5%. Uh, we recently introduced Daniel Locker from Western Areas. So he is um, over 20 years of operating nickel mines in uh, Western Australia. So um, yeah, and a really uh, good addition to the team recently. So you can see here where we're located in Northern Vietnam, approximately five hours west of Hanoi. Um, and we we have two projects that we're looking to build. The Taqua Nickel project is our upstream mine mining project, which is where the existing concentrator is. We're looking to build us a new concentrator, much larger scale uh, mine than was previously operating. You can see there we have 485,000 tonnes of nickel in resource and over 200,000 tonnes in reserve. So it'll be a large scale open pit with a low strip ratio. And most importantly, we'll have uh, access to that hydro power through the grid. The refinery is where we take nickel concentrate from our mine and we convert it into the first stage of the lithium ion battery, which is called a nickel precursor um, with nickel, cobalt and manganese in the ratio of 811. You can see there we also have interest in other nickel developers and the idea being is that we will bring imported nickel into Vietnam and upgrade it into these chemical products. So we're working very closely with our investors uh, investments in in uh, Manitoba and Western Australia. The idea being is that we can um, export nickel concentrate from these products and import it into the Vietnam refinery. So you can see here we're also working very closely with nickel trading groups like Trafigura and other nickel traders. The idea being that they would 
feed their nickel into our refinery and we would convert it into this NCM 811 product. You can see this is where we will bring in the downstream partners. Uh, we're open to a partnership where we would um, sell down up to 50% of the project. This is a large scale project and, and the funding will, will come from these downstream partners. This is the most important part of our story. It's the fact that we have the lowest carbon footprint nickel in the industry. And we have that, has, that has been independently verified by the Nickel Institute. And um, we also use Minviro uh, for the life cycle analysis. Um, the other benefits of sulfide nickel, yeah, vertically integrated value chain. So minimizing uh, transportation of intermediate products, localizing the refinery near the, the nickel mine. We're also looking at electric mining fleet. In our pre-feasibility study, we, we worked a, a full electric mining fleet into that study, and we have a corporate commitment to ESG. So a lot of people ask, well, what is it like to operate in Vietnam? Uh, we've, we've operated all through the globe. Um, we've done a lot of emerging markets work through Africa. We've never had a jurisdiction that is so favorable from a, a tax perspective but most importantly, a cost perspective. Um, we've got some of the, some of the best um, young geologists, mining engineers and metallurgists that we've seen anywhere in the world. And, um, and they're very hardworking. So we have the abundant renewable power. So uh, when the mine previously operated, the power cost was around seven cents per kilowatt hour. So yeah, very well located. You can see there that's a previously operating mine. So we have a good history of operating. Our subsidiary company has operated in Vietnam for over 20 years. So this is the cost curve for nickel sulfate. So these are all the, the current um, operators of that are feeding into the lithium ion battery industry. You can see we, we will be well positioned in the first quartile on the, on the cost curve. You can see some of the higher cost operators, uh, particularly um, the nickel laterite HPAL processes through Indonesia and, um, and globally. But most importantly, the, the sulfide nickel allows us to have an ability to move towards net zero carbon from day one. So we, we did the work with Minviro. You can see there we've, we've got a, a roadmap to net zero and we're, we're very focused on this and this is this is really being pushed from our downstream partners what we're hearing is that the downstream partners are will be putting threshold limits on carbon for nickel particularly the european electric vehicle manufacturers we we we're confident that this will put us in a very strong position with respect to the partnerships but also with in in the industry we think that this is the future of, of nickel sulfides and, and the, um, the ability to convert nickel concentrate directly into these chemical products is the most efficient way to put nickel into a battery. So you can see here, this is our, our district. We have a number of uh, ore bodies. The large uh, Banfork disseminated is the flagship asset. So that's a large open pit. We have a number of small underground nickel mines as well. They will all feed into a centrally located concentrator, which will be right next to the large open pit mine. So we're very well located in, a, in geology, which is very similar to Jinchuan and Narilf, which are two of the largest nickel sulfide systems in the world. So we've got some of the best geology in the world and we're very much uh, underexplored. So we will continue to explore this. Um, we have 10 years of mine life already. We think that we can go well beyond that. So you can see here, this is the, the open pit. So it's a large scale open pit, very similar to uh, the Mount Keith nickel mine in Western Australia. Uh, so low strip ratio, the, the mine will produce approximately 18,000 tonnes per annum of nickel. And then we'll top up the refinery with 50% of the feed will come from areas like Australia and Canada. So 50% of the feed into the mine will come from the, the Banfoot uh, disseminated open pit and then 50% will be imported from around the world. Just quickly on the process, um, my background's in mining engineering. So this is a, a new hobby of mine, getting into the chemical part of the business. 
Um, pressure oxidation is the process we're looking at. It's a tried and tested technology used all through the industry since the 1960s. You combine that with another process called solvent extraction, which is also a tried and tested technology, which we've been using for, since the 1960s also. So those two uh, technologies combined uh, allow us to convert the nickel concentrate into the chemical products. The first chemical product we will produce is mixed hydroxide precipitate, MHP. We'll then do a further leach on that and we would um, bring that to a nickel and cobalt sulfate. We'll, we'll then import manganese sulfate and we would combine them in the ratio of 811. We see that that ratio may change over time. So at the moment, there's a, a push towards even higher nickel and less cobalt. So we, we do have some cobalt in our nickel mine. And so we're confident that um, we, we potentially might not have to actually import any cobalt into our refinery. One of the benefits of this technology this hydromet uh, process is that it is a very flexible flow sheet. We can use different concentrates that are potentially not suitable for the stainless steel industry. High arsenic ore, high MGO ore that currently is um, penal penalised in the stainless steel industry is very suitable for our refinery. We also have the ability to feed MHP as a feedstock. So we can arbitrage the, the cost differential between nickel concentrate and um, MHP, depending on what, what is happening in the, in the market. We can also feed nickel mat and black mass, which is the recycled product from the lithium ion battery. So a very flexible flow sheet, um, a tried and tested technology. So there's nothing novel about what we're doing here. And that's, that was a particular focus of our downstream partners. They didn't want us to try anything different than what had already been used in the industry before. And to, to uh, finalize that process, we've completed a pilot plant. Over the last 12 months, we've, we've had over 1800 hours of runtime in the ALS laboratories in Perth. Um, we combined nickel concentrate from our mine. So we actually did a, a large underground a bulk sample. We put that through the existing concentrator in Vietnam. We've, then we sent the concentrate to Perth. We combined that with um, third-party feed from Trafigura, and we um, simulated the, the process of the downstream business. The recoveries were better than we expected. So the pre-feasibility study, we assume 96% and we we're getting greater than 97% in, in that pilot plant phase. Most importantly, we, uh, we have produced battery grade nickel sulfate and, nickel and battery grade cobalt sulfate, which can now be sent to our downstream partners for analysis and allows us to continue the negotiations with our downstream partners. We also have a, a concentrator on site and a, and a pilot plant on site as well in Vietnam. So we've done some, some good work at the upstream level as well. I, um, we were seeing a better recovery when we were um, uh, putting the nickel, uh, the nickel ore through the concentrator than, than what we were seeing in the lab. So it's a big uh, 12 months ahead. Uh, it's, it's really about completing the DFS. The definitive feasibility study will be completed in the next three three months. We'll then move into the funding phase. We will lock in a, a partner, a large partner, then the debt will flow from there. So we'll, 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 we will fund this over the next six months and, and we will rewrite. Re so I'm very confident of that. And it's going to be a big 12 months for the Blackstone Minerals. Thank you very much. I've got way too many of these uh, microphones in front of me, haven't I? I was not playing microphone with it a little bit. Thank you so much for that, Scott. Really interesting to hear the full story fleshed out there. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people will be coming and have a chat with you at our drinks tonight, thanks to Lund Partners. We have one more speech, one more opportunity in this section for you to take on board. Then we've got our panel discussion, afternoon tea. And we've got a bit of a focus on rare earths in the last section of today, finishing up with our rare earths panel and then those drinks. So, a minerals exploration company with the bold aim of becoming a key player in the resurgence of the nickel sector is the next one for you all to consider 
in your investment portfolio. They have a focus on nickel sulfide exploration and discovery. The company is London Metals and they actually own two prospective Western Australian projects. And they're in the world famous Cambelda project. And you can come and speak to me about that later on if you like. I don't actually mind Cambelda. Beautiful area. And they've got the most beautiful trees out there. And they're called gimlets, golden gimlets. And they're absolutely stunning when the sun sets. If that's not reason enough to be out there, apart from this nickel discovery, I don't know what else is. This fellow here who actually wants to speak to you about sensible things for your investment portfolio is their MD. His name is Edmund Ainscoe. Now he's well placed to tell the story so far. He's been out there for more than 20 years. And let's hear for the, the story and the next compelling chapter of London. I can welcome please. Thanks, Chrissy. Uh, I'd just like to thank the conference organizers, uh, especially the conference sponsors, Tribeca um, and Argonaut, both uh, shareholders, very supportive shareholders, uh, hopefully very happy shareholders. The presentation has been lodged on ASX. It's also available on our website if you'd like to read the disclaimer and the full resource statement is at the end of the slides also. So still in nickel, uh, after Scott's presentation in, in Vietnam, we're here in West Australia. London Metals is an ASX listed nickel explorer uh, and an aspiring nickel producer. We're based in West Australia. As you've heard throughout the conference, Western Australia is a center of excellence for mining. Uh, and exploration, no surprise, it also has a world leading regulatory framework within which we all operate. So a lot of the ESG concerns, a lot of the transition to ESG already very heavily regulated uh, and, and looked after by the West Australian government. Our assets are in Cambauda. Cambauda is one of the world's most famous nickel districts. It's certainly Australia's most prolific nickel district. 1.6 million tonnes of nickel metal has been mined in Cambauda since it was founded in 1966 by WMC Resources. Uh, and I'll show you in a moment. It has an amazing and unrivaled uh, ability to continue to yield discoveries. Uh, because of that long history, 55 plus years of mining in Cambauda, there's significant existing infrastructure in place. And we can leverage off that infrastructure. Uh, I'll, again, I'll show you that in a moment. But it means our impact on the environment for the activities we plan is low. But while our impact is low, the value of our assets is high. The mineral resource grades above 3%. Uh, we believe we'll be able to produce a premium concentrate uh, because of that infrastructure, uh, because of that existing history. Uh, and we're on granted mining leases. The lead time to move from being an explorer to a producer is short. Uh, and the capital required to do that is minimal. And all of that has a positive impact on those communities that Chrissy mentioned. Chrissy yesterday was uh, telling everyone she's a Kalgoorlie girl. Uh, I've lived and worked in Cambalda, Kalgoorlie for eight years. Uh, the certainty, uh, the knowledge that you've got confident projects uh, that are cash flow positive is good for the community. It's good for certainty. It in in includes jobs spent by us, spent by our employees. Uh, and that's the confidence and certainty that these regional communities really crave. So for those of you less familiar with the ge uh, geography of Western Australia, we're headquartered in Perth. Our assets, Cambauda, uh, are about 600 kilometres east of Perth, just near Kalgoorlie. Uh, we listed in June 2021. We've had a very successful nearly two years now. Uh, and that success has been underpinned by a discovery made called Baker. Uh, I'll show you some detail on Baker in a moment. Uh, we've actually added nearly 50,000 tonnes of nickel metal to the inventory we had when we uh, listed in June 21. Uh, it's a 125% increase. We've done it at a very competitive uh, discovery cost as well. Uh, and as you no doubt would imagine, there's been a lot of news flow associated with drilling uh, and making that discovery. We've drilled nearly 50 kilometres of drilling. We've reprocessed nearly 11 kilometres of historical core. We've got over 500 kilometres of historical WMC core that we have access to. Uh, we can reprocess, recut, relog. It allows us to convert historical remnants from WMC days into modern compliant jaw resources. But we haven't just relied on the drill bit. Uh, we've grown by acquisition uh, from our major shareholder, Goldfields. We acquired the last two nickel mines in Cambauda that had never previously been transacted, Silver Lake and Fisher last year. Uh, and in parallel to that, we raised $30 million. Uh, so to set ourselves up for the future, but more important, or just as important, uh, we've recruited uh, an executive leadership team that has a deep operational, technical, legal, and commercial history, not just in mining, but actually in Cambauda mining. So we've set ourselves up for the future with our asset base, with our funding, uh, and with our leadership team. Just a little history on Cambauda. 
uh, WMC that found the district, as I said, uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, made a strategic decision to exit its ownership of its mines in Cambauda, both nickel and gold. Cambauda is also a very significant gold camp currently in the hands of gold fields. Um, and it sold those nickel mines to three junior companies, Minkel, Panoramic and Independence. Uh, and the chart on the left shows you three pairs of bubbles. The smaller bubble in each case is the amount of nickel metal that WMC had mined to the point of sale. And the larger bubble is all the nickel that's been mined to date. And the difference is obviously the amount of nickel that WMC left on the table. Uh, this is testament to the amazing ability of the Cambauda district to yield new discoveries, uh, extensions of existing resources. Uh, our assets at the time of that strategic exit had already been shut down. The table on the right shows you they shut in the 80s and early 90s. They were significant assets in their own right. They produced 250,000 tons of nickel, but they were shut when WMC exited. So they got sold with the gold to gold fields and essentially of lay fallow until we put our foot on them in 2015 as a private company. So our goal is quite simply to have a larger second green bubble uh, and enjoy and replicate the success uh, of those three junior companies in the last nickel boom. So we like Cambauda for that reason. Obviously, Cambauda is pretty topical at the moment. Uh, it's a current M&A hotspot. Wailu Metals, which is Andrew Forrest's private uh, mining investment vehicle, uh, is busy in an on-market takeover of Minkle Resources, who are our nearest neighbour uh, and the only other ASX-listed nickel company that has assets in Cambauda. Uh, that's obviously the goalposts have moved quite considerably on that. But the reason we like it, the reason Andrew Forrest likes it, uh, because it is such a globally significant nickel camp. It has been and will continue to be a key source of strategic nickel sulfides into the future because of that discovery record. Uh, and we're well placed. We've got just under 3 million tonnes at over 3% nickel uh, for just under 80,000 nickel tonnes in mineral resource. Notwithstanding, that's a, a great start. We still think our tenement base is underexplored. And I'll show you some of that towards the end of the, of, of the talk. So this is how our assets stack up. Uh, Baker is the discovery we've made. Uh, Baker now, having been quite recently discovered, is our mo most mature asset it, because it's a very attractive asset. The grade is very high. And we focus very strongly on it. Uh, we've advanced the drilling, uh, the quantification of risk, uh, the test work, uh, and the resource study work. And we've also advanced the permitting quite considerably at Baker. So it's actually gone past Foster which was the asset we listed on with 39,000 nickel tons. It's an old historical mine, Foster, but Baker's gone past Foster uh, in terms of our focus and our consideration. But Foster in its own right is a really significant asset, 57,000 nickel tons at just under 3%. Uh, and then the deal we did last year, as I mentioned with Goldfields, brought Silver Lake and Fisher into the portfolio. That enables us to keep that news flow going. It enables us to keep being really aggressive uh, and as Eddie Riggs said this morning, if you listen to his keynote address, you can't find anything unless the drill rigs are turning. So Silver Lake and Fisher just open up the exploration portfolio for us again, as we advance our more, advanced, uh, our more mature assets through to permitting uh, and aspiring production. So a little bit of detail on Baker. Uh, like I said, we found this. It's a million tonnes at 3.3%. Uh, 24,000 nickel tons of that sits in the indicated category and all the indicated that's currently the subject of a PFS that should be completed in the next four to six weeks sits in the top 200 meters. So it's very shallow. Uh, because it's shallow, we've been able to drill it really aggressively. We've put 15 kilometers of RC, five kilometers of diamond into this deposit. Uh, so as I said, we've quantified the geology, the metallurgy, the, uh, the geotechnical aspects, We've quantified that risk. We believe it's low. Uh, we think the value of the product is going to be high. Uh, we've done some initial met metallurgical test work, which we reported last year. We're doing much more detailed metallurgical test work currently. Uh, the indications are it will produce a premium concentrate high in nickel, copper, and cobalt, and very topically uh, with respect to the recent uh, developments with Wailu and Minkor, very low in contaminants, particularly arsenic. And as I said, we can leverage off the existing infrastructure uh, this part of Cambauda has been mined for 50 plus years. Uh, there's haul roads, there's dumps, there's access ways. Our disturbance from this point on is very minimal. Uh, and significantly, there's an open pit about 450 metres away. That's a gold open pit. We have access to that. That can be our portal site. So we can get to our from surface to the top of our ore body very quickly. Uh, it's on granted M's. Uh, the lead time to move, as I said, from explorer to producer is extremely short and the capital should be quite modest. 
I have to keep reminding myself uh, because we've been so focused on Baker uh, that Foster in its own right is, is as I said, a significant asset, 57,000 nickel tonnes. Foster shut in the 90s, it produced 61,000 nickel tonnes before it shut. Uh, we've got a, an inventory now of 57,000 nickel tonnes. Again, it's on granted M's. Again, there's a lot of existing infrastructure. This mine is flooded, but we've already permitted to dewater and discharge that water with a view to re-enter, to explore. But when we do that, the ability to pivot from exploration to production will be very easy should we make that choice. We'll move the study focus from Baker onto Foster uh, when Baker is finished and reported. Uh, and a big focus of that study will be to look at whether we do Baker first whether we do Baker with Foster and look at the option value of the nickel we have in the ground uh, in a very strategic belt in Cambauda, uh, which is obviously, as I said, currently an m and hotspot. So last year we acquired the last two nickel mines. This is a map of Cambauda, uh, the southern half of the Cambauda Dome, the famous Cambauda Dome, outlined in white, shaded red, is the tenement package where we have the nickel rights it came with two nickel mines, Fisher and Silver Lake. They produced 160,000 nickel tons between them prior to shutting in the 80s. The northern half of the Cambalda Dome sits uh, within the Minkor, and it's subject to Wailu's takeover offer. There's a yellow line traced on the surface on the aerial map. That is a key geological contact. All the nickel that's ever been found in Cambalda, 1.6 million tons of nickel metal, sits at or extremely close to that contact. And you can see the blue dots are the historical and current operations of Minkor resources hugging that contact. That contact obviously runs through our tenement package uh, and the area we're particularly excited about is circled here. Uh, there's an area there where there's two to three square kilometers where there's no drilling, not just no drilling by WMC, no drilling at all. And that's a function of how WMC went about exploring its ore bodies. It found them, it got underground, got very close and personal, but it left a lot of nickel ahead of itself as evidenced by those junior companies success on the chart I showed you earlier. So we're really excited about that. We're doing some seismic work. There's a seismic slice that was done by independence back in 2008 and published in 2012. Um, and for the geophysicists in the room, hopefully you can see the channels that's gone currently on Minkor's ground tracking south onto our ground. Uh, we're doing our own seismic. And we're very excited about that. Uh, it kicked off last month. Uh, this is the rig on the Salt Lake. Uh, it looks pretty wet. It doesn't take much rain up in Cambauda for that lake to get inundated. Uh, but they successfully uh, completed the survey. We haven't seen the data yet, but we understand it's clean. Uh, if we get any obvious targets, any obvious reflectors uh, that line up with any of those channels coming off Minkor's ground, we'll be very keen to uh, get the drill rigs there as quickly as possible and test them. On the left of this slide uh, are all the things we ticked off in the March quarter. It was a busy quarter. Uh, as I said, the, very much the focus of the June quarter um, is the Baker PFS. We'll report that. That will include reporting of ore reserves significantly. That will enable us to initiate offtake discussions uh, with offtake partners. Uh, the most notable and the closest is Nickel West with their concentrator that's only 20 kilometers north of Baker. Uh, but, and we'll continue to permit Baker and Foster to push it ahead to de risk those projects while we start then uh, hopefully generating news flow from our new Silver Lake and Fisher drilling activities once that targeting is complete. So busy last quarter, lots to do in the June quarter, lots to do for the rest of 23. Quick look at the uh, corporate overview. As I said, uh, when you look at the 10 people on, on the board and the executive, five of those people collectively lived uh, and worked in Cambalda for WMC and Goldfields for probably a total of over 50 years between them. Uh, we got long and deep experience in, in the operations, the technical, the geological, commercial, and legal aspects of running a mining business in Cambalda. Just under 200 million shares on issue, uh, bouncing around about $1.10 at the moment. We were at 90 cents before uh, Wailu launched the offer on Minkor Resources. So we capitalized about 220 million, no debt, uh, still plenty of cash left from that raising in April last year. So we've got a management team in place, we've got the cash at hand, and most importantly, we've got the assets in a really historic and actually prolific nickel district. Just on the register of, of note, Goldfields is 34% and is still our major shareholder. The founders of the company have about 30%, the top 20 round out at around 80%. So it's great for downside protection, also great for protection should a suitor come calling, looking to add London Metals assets to their portfolio. So to finish up, it's a great time to be in nickel. Uh, we've got four nickel mines. We've made one discovery. 
we've been really aggressive. We've been rewarded for being aggressive. Uh, we've increased our mineral resource base. It's a fantastic place to do business. As Chrissy has mentioned, as other presenters have mentioned, Kalgoorlie Kambalda is a very good place to run a mining business. But fundamentally, what underpins, underpins the value of London Metals is its address in Kambalda. Uh, and I think we're seeing with the current corporate activities that are happening in the market, uh, that that value really is beginning to win out. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, do look us up on social media. Uh, just a warning, hashtag LMA, which is our hashtag. It is also the hashtag for Lionel Messi to win his eighth Ballon d'Or. So if you type it into Twitter, uh, don't be surprised if it's not about geology, it's not about Cambalda. Uh, and someone said to me that most West Australians think that image, uh, looking at that image and saying, who's that? How has he won so many Oscars? Who is it? It's, well, there you go, that's a perfect example. So Lionel Messi, supposedly the world's best footballer, uh, he's won seven Ballon d'Ors and he's up for his eighth. Captain, who is he? Lionel Messi. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention. Please come and see us if you've got any further questions before the conference finishes this afternoon. Thank you very much. Got to go back to your microphone one by quick quip now. Now it's gone. The moment's gone. I was going to say he's got too many clothes on his wonderful legs. So I didn't need to look up any further. Right. We've got chairs coming out and I've got five esteemed uh, experts coming up to join me on the stage. Would you like to come up, gentlemen? This is our second last panel of the day. We're talking more about decarbonisation and uh, materials. I've got Todd Warren. Portfolio Manager, taking the lead. Would you like to come up first, sir? You, it's your job to uh, moderate this panel, keep everyone in line. You've got 30 minutes. I will give you a five-minute warning bell. You should have your microphone on your seats, boys. Keep your microphone nice and close to your chin. And remember, as you move around, you need to keep it in front of your face. It's my own fault for not instructing you about this earlier on today. We want the quality of what is going out to... Do you know we've got 800 people? online watching this so there's 1300 of us who registered and come along here but we've actually got 800 people who are at home at or in their offices at the moment so remiss of me not to say hello to you and thank you for logging in and being part of this we really appreciate it so one of the other things while the boys are getting ready behind me is most of the company presentations i'm looking at jackson as i say this will be available eventually on our youtube channel but also make sure you go to each of the company's web pages as well because they'll have that under their investor tab as well. And if you are at home and you want to have a bit of a chat with some of these guys in person, I'm sure none of you would mind taking the phone call, would you? A oh, little smiley faces, no. JT says, fine, call me anytime. Just remember what remember what time zone I'm in is what he'd actually like to do. All right, so hands up, please, fellas. You can identify yourself for the audience. Stephen Wells in the middle. There you go, Stephen. Stephen is, would you like to do this? No, Todd, this is actually your gig. So at five minutes, I'll give you a five-minute signal, and that's your cue to kind of rein these guys in, okay? Would you please make everyone welcome on our panel? Oh, we're good. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Todd Warren. I'm a uh, partner and portfolio manager for Tribeca Investment Partners. Uh, we are very active investors, as you may have already gathered, in the resources patch. I've been running a global resources fund for a, a long period of time, and we are investors in every single one of these companies that you see here today. Uh, I will introduce each of them, um, uh, and then I'll ask each of you uh, to uh, run through your companies briefly, and then we'll talk you through some decarbonisation materials. Uh, first up on my left, Alex Dorsch. Uh, the MD and CEO of Chalice Mining. Uh, Alex joined Chalice in 2017, was appointed MD in November of 2018. Alex has led Chalice through an exceptional, exceptional recent growth period and has been recognised as new emerging leader of the year by Mining News and CEO of the year by Kitco. And most recently, the Young Mining Professionals Toronto chapter, the 2022 Peter Monk Award. Alex has diverse experience in a variety of leadership roles across the resources sector as a management consultant, engineer, project manager, and corporate advisor. Prior to joining Chalice, he was working as a specialist consultant with the global management consultancy, Kinsey and Company. He commenced his, his engineering career with resources giant BHP, 
in Adelaide and then spent over six years as an engineer in oil and gas exploration. Alex holds a Bachelor of Mechanical Engineering with first class honours and a Bachelor of Finance from the University of Adelaide. Mr. Dorsch is also a member of the Technical Committee for Chalice Mining. Welcome, Alex. Thanks, Todd. On Alex's left is Steve Wells. Steve, I'm far out. I can't read this, Steve. It's too small. <laughs> Steve is the CFO for Syrah uh, Resources uh, with a graphite project uh, in Mozambique. Uh, I honestly cannot read this. Um, uh, perhaps you can uh, help me out, Steve. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's right. I am Steve Wells. So you got that part right. <laughs> <Good start. laughs> um, CFO at Sire Resources since uh, August 2019. Um, we'll, we'll get into the company introductions a bit, bit later, but my background um, being the CFO sort of guy is a finance background, um, working in banking in London, Singapore and, and New York, um, and also Australia. Uh, a little bit of time for BHP as well, um, and then joined Sire as I say in 2019 and been responsible, obviously, for helping with the um, investment decisions around expanding our downstream project in Louisiana, but um, also raising some of the funding that we've been working on with the US Department of Energy, um, which I'll also talk about in a bit more detail, but thanks. Thank you, Steve. Next up, JT Starzecki, uh, Chief Marketing Officer for 5E Advanced Materials. JT is a global business executive with extensive experience in the junior mining and minerals fo space focused on market development, capital raising, project finance, business strategy, and product placement. Prior to joining 5E Advanced Materials, he was the Chief Marketing Officer for Anglo-American Crop Nutrients, focusing on building the largest greenfield fertilizer mining operation around the world. JT has been a board advisor, member of the boards of various junior mining companies focused on various minerals, including gold, magnesite, kaolin, tungsten, and nickel. JT holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in accounting from St. John's University. I couldn't have said it better myself, Todd. <laughs> Uh, and last but not least, Aaron Colloran, MD and CEO of AIC Mines. Aaron has extensive experience in public markets, mergers and acquisitions and strategic planning. Prior to joining AIC, Aaron was a founding member of the leadership team of Australian gold producer Evolution Mining, having managed its business development and investor relations program from an inception through to 2018. He was instrumental in the multiple merger and acquisition transactions that created Evolution Mining now one of Australia's largest gold mining companies. Originally an exploration geologist, he worked as a mining analyst with stockbroker Ayers Reed before moving into investment banking with CIBC and Standard Bank. In 2006, Aaron set up a, consulting, a consultancy providing co corporate advice to resource companies and worked closely with companies including Centimen, Egypt and Sino Gold. Welcome, Aaron. Thanks, Todd. So uh, we've heard an awful lot about lithium and there's I think uh, a better knowledge of lithium as one of the crucial uh, enabling commodities of decarbonization one of the key future facing commodities but there is less known about some of the commodities which these gentlemen uh, will enlighten you about today uh, perhaps first I'll ask each of you to give a quick rundown on your companies uh, and then we'll delve into some of the key factors that uh, you guys will be involved in going forward Sure. Thanks, Todd. So I think um, Chalice is uh, a very unique uh, company. About three years ago, we made a major greenfield discovery in Western Australia uh, called Julemar. It's a, it's a, a polymetallic um, nickel sulfide discovery. Um, it also has quite a lot of copper, cobalt, palladium, platinum, and a little bit of gold in it as well. Um, it's a, now a, a 3 million tonne uh, equivalent nickel resource. Uh, open pitable um, and uh, obviously in the early stages of development resource stage but we're um, rapidly I guess advancing our understanding of the asset and then ultimately how we're going to process and, and extract the the minerals um, so it's been a, a it's been a tremendous uh, and I guess high profile discovery which has uh, I guess put a, a spotlight on on I guess the the industry um, I get that there hasn't been a lot of major discoveries made in those set of commodities and, and particular in PGEs. You know, it's the it's the only real major PGE discovery outside of South Africa and Russia. Platinum so, um, group metals. Yeah, so platinum group element or platinum group metal, depending on who you are. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a um, ASX 200 company um, capitalized at uh, just a smidge under 3 billion Australian dollars. Thanks, Alex. Steve? Thanks very much. Um, so, Sire Resources, hello again. 
Uh, we're an ASX 200 company also, um, probably a bit north of a billion dollars um, at the moment, and we focus on graphite anode materials. So for those that you don't know, um, graphite goes into the anode side of the battery, lithium and some of the other metals often go into the cathode side. Um, but graphite is very much, you know, anywhere between 90 and 100% of the, the anode side. Um, we have a, an operation in Mozambique in Africa that we've been running now and producing graphite for four or five years, produced over 500,000 tonnes of, of natural graphite, which goes into the anode side of the battery. So um, been sending that material out into the market. There's every chance that a, an EV driving around Singapore has SIRA material in it. Um, it's currently blended. Uh, we also made a decision um, back in 2016 to search for a downstream processing opportunity. Um, and we looked around the world and decided that Louisiana in the United States was the best location for that. So we're in the middle of um, building our first downstream facility of about 11,000 tonnes. Um, and we have an offtake sign with Tesla around that. Um, we also have um, some funding from the US Department of Energy for about 100 million to help us build that. Uh, and we're also currently progressing um, our intention to go from 11,000 tonnes a year to 45,000 tonnes a year. And we were selected for a grant from the US Department of Energy for about $220 million um, to help facilitate that. So once we, once we uh, finish construction this year in Louisiana, we'll actually um, have completed the first vertically integrated provider of natural graphite active anode material outside China. Um, other than us, it's very much dominated by um, the Chinese in this particular supply chain, which is um, one of the reasons why we're getting quite a bit of support from the US government in particular. So. Thanks, Dave. Uh, JT? JT Starzaki, 5E Advanced Materials. Um, 5E is, is um, a, one of the uh, upcoming producers of boric acid in the United States. Um, we're building a project in the on the West Coast in California. We are an ASX 300 listed company, so uh, we're one step below. We're also dual listed on the NASDAQ. Um, and we were we listed about a year and a little over a year ago on the NASDAQ. Um, we spent a lot of time educating the US market on boric acid specifically. We're one of only six visible projects that are sort of on the radar. Um, we are the closest to production. We're actually completing our small scale facility. We're at the tail end of commissioning um, and we will be producing uh, smaller scale amounts of boric acid. As part of the process, we're an in-situ leaching mining operation. And as part of that, we do have some lithium carbonate that comes out. We don't, we talk about it from a revenue perspective, but we are very much a boric acid producer. Um, there's only two in the United States, there's only two domestic boric acid producers, Rio Tinto being one and a small a group called Sears Valley. Um, we sit in that same deposit um, and we have a we have a play across multiple decarbonization technology. So we do play into the EV space more in the permanent magnet and the motor side versus the battery side. Uh, but we also have a play in, in solar energy and wind energy, um, specifically in the in the motors and the magnets. So uh, it's great to be on this panel and and be able to talk about some of the other things besides lithium. Thanks, JT. Aaron. Yep. Um, AIC Mines, uh, an Australian copper producer, and uh, it's worth noting AIC doesn't isn't my initials. Um, it, it does date back. It no longer stands. So I, I like to say it stands for authenticity, integrity, and creativity. Three of the things we'd like to have uh, in the group. Uh, at least two of them we do. Um, we clearly don't have creativity because our name's AIC. <laughs> as soon as we think of something clever, we'll we'll, we'll change the name. Uh, we're currently producing copper at a little uh, underground uh, copper mine in North Queensland uh, in the Mount Isa Cloncurry region, one you know, globally or worldwide, one of the most productive, uh, you know, one of the most famous copper producing regions in the world. Um, that's a small mine that we're currently undertaking an expansion uh, at, uh, at a, a satellite deposit to lift that production up um, elsewhere within the group. We have exploration assets, but we're building, uh, we've got a great exploration team. We're also building up our development team. Uh, they're cutting their teeth on the expansion uh, at Eloise. Um, and uh, that fits nicely into our strategy to continue to build the company um, through through three three ways, through exploration, so through discovery, through development, we'll, we'll buy and build mines. Uh, and obviously through acquisition, which is my background, as is um, almost uh, you know, a, a significant portion of the team at AIC Mines. Um, we're a, a, a group who have all worked together um, previously at Evolution Mining, 
um, where, where we did something very similar in the gold space um, through essentially a roll-up strategy or building a company um, with a number of small mines to deliver reliable results through diversification. Um, this team is now trying to do exactly the same thing uh, in the copper space. Uh, that's now underway with our first cornerstone asset at Eloise and Jericho and, and actively on the hunt for our next copper asset. Thanks. Thanks, Aaron. Um, I thought we might start, uh, Steve, you touched on it there with the dominance that China has had uh, in certainly the downstream processing of, of many of the uh, decarbonisation enabling commodities. We've got two companies that have got an Australian um, uh, uh, location and then two companies with a, a US um, location. We've got the situation now with the somewhat strangely named US Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which as far as I can tell is actually more designed to introduce critical mineral processing to the US. Can you guys touch on the strategic angle of commodities, um, specific obviously to the commodities you produce, but also where you see that influencing the supply of commodities going forward? Um, Maybe actually start with the US, um, Steve, JT, if you want to start with that one first. Sure, thanks. Um, look, look, it's a really interesting one. I mean, graphite is a critical mineral. Um, there are 49 others. Um, it's defined by the, the US government and they're not all equal. They are ranked. Um, the sort of first ranking I would put them in are, are they relating to defence? Um, and graphite's got a bit of a play in that because it does do batteries and everything uses batteries. But um, but is it then commercial and graphite probably fits more more importantly in that commercial space with EVs as well as, you know, any other lithium ion battery use, whether it's your iPhone or your iPad or whatever. Um, so that, that's kind of the first filter. Um, and then the second filter is, can you get it in the United States? Is it easily available? And there isn't that much graphite and certainly not developed graphite in, in North America at all. There's a few projects up in Canada and a little bit in mainland US, but very, very little apart from that and certainly not nearly enough to um, satisfy their requirements um, and then another screening criteria is as you think about critical minerals as well what's the what are the alternatives does it come from um, a free trade agreement country or something else and, and fundamentally any lithium-ion battery that has graphite in it um, natural graphite in it comes through China at some point in time it's 100% reliant on on China um, and that's the other sort of element that the, the US seems to look at so when, um, when we're talking about SIRA, um, and we sort of identified this opportunity really back in 2016 before it became politically and commercially important, um, the ability to you know, basically have uh, access to the, the largest graphite asset on the planet um, in, in Balama, um, which has got a 50 year mine life at, at really significant volume, and then send that to the United States for downstream processing is really a template for how to I um, mean, this particular supply chain re reduce reliance on um, on China for, for natural graphite active anode material. Doesn't mean we'll um, necessarily replace the importance of China. It'll always be really important. They'll continue to grow and continue to invest, but we'll continue to um, build out our downstream processing capacity in the United States as, as fast as we possibly can. So we have some some really interesting parallels in in the market that we deal in. So in the boron space, 65% um, of the boric acid produced comes out of Turkey. Another, call it 20, 25% comes out of the U.S. with the small operation in Rio Tinto. But 90% of the actual processing of downstream derivative materials comes out of China. Um, so certainly one of the concepts that we're playing into, at least as a U.S.-based company, is, is moving downstream. So the production of boric acid, but then also the production of advanced materials. Boron does have a lot of military and aerospace applications, boron nitride, boron carbides, tank armor, Kevlar, um, all of that has an input of, of boric acid. And it's, you know, we're in a unique situation in that the U.S. military tends to buy all of that product that's essentially mined in California, sent to China for processing, and then is brought back into the U.S. for military applications. So our, our name sort of says it all, 5E advanced materials. So we, our plan is to, to to not only have a captive supply of boric acid, but then also produce a certain amount of advanced downstream derivatives um, to sort of lessen that supply uh, and, and bring more of the processing back into the U.S. So very similar in, in a lot of different uh, in a lot of different areas. But um, that's that's sort of what we've been working on and what we'll ultimately do with our our 
phase one facility that's commissioning now and about to come on stream is we can repurpose that as we add more and more production to the Bork, to the Bork acid market, we can then refactor that, that whole operation to specifically um, create downstream advanced boron materials. Maybe a, a, come at this from a slightly different angle on the influence that governments will have on supply, but also funding. Um, maybe Aaron, as a producer of a, um, not a new age commodity, commodity has been around for a long time, but obviously very uh, important for future facing angles. How do you see government influence and the funding side of things influencing, uh, I guess the production of copper or indeed also that deglobalization or, or onshoring influencing the inflationary aspects as well? Yeah. I'll answer it a couple of different ways, but um, it, it's not a new, it's not a new commodity by any means. Um, it's been around since since mankind were making things out of copper or bronze for that. But um, looking forward, you know, for the energy transition, it's a very important metal. And and so your point is valid. You know, is how are we going to deliver enough copper? You know, how are we going to double um, copper production? You know, as as a, as a number of forecasters suggest, how are we going to double supply over the next ten to fifteen years? Um, and that's, you know, it's got to take a lot of things, but, you know, an important part of that is funding. Now, um, copper's probably not a hard, not a hard metal to fund. You know, the, the, you know it's uh, LME traded, you know, it's, there's a forward curve, um, you know, a classic bank will do it. And from a government angle, you know, for the small funding that we've got to expand at LOEs, um, um, it, there, it, it isn't required, but NAIF in Australia is fantastic. It really is. But, um, um, for us, it's not relevant. You know, our funding is almost too easy, and, and copper is not a hard metal. You know, not a hard project. Uh, you know, there's there's no um, uh, cutting edge. There's no unusual mining methods. There's no unusual processing methods. The, but I'll pick up on another point where where government though is you know is very important to us, um, and I hope there's someone from the Queensland government here at the moment because I'll say something very positive. But the 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 recent. Um, approval and the government and the Queensland government taking ownership of the Copper String 2 um, power transmission line from Townsville across to Mount Isa is, you know, is an incredible, I, I can't under, you know, undersell, is, is an incredible breakthrough for North Queensland. And that's for two reasons. So that, that um, for those of you who don't know, you know, Mount Isa is in north northwest or northern Queensland, Townsville's on the coast, Townsville's on the grid, the Queensland grid. Um, this is basically connecting that grid and taking grid power into copper producing heartland. What's important about that? You know, there's there's two things. Obviously, grid power for us it'll be a third a third of the price that we produce power. Then think that through. We're producing power with diesel generators. We can't produce green copper. You know, with diesel generators. You know that, that that's you know that's like you know charging your electric car. With a with a with a with a diesel generator, it it, it doesn't work. So, um, connecting in to Copper String Two for us um, is a two year payback. Um, you know, our, literally our, our power costs don't halve; they go down by a third, and we'll be able to connect into renewable power and produce green copper within Australia with that credential. That's that's really breakthrough stuff for us, and it's only. The government that can help with that and it's been fantastic that they've finally stepped up to the plate and approved and, and taken control of that copper string too which has been trying to get off the ground for for at least the last two if not three years but it's there let's see if they can actually start building it uh, and come in somewhere near budget voyage you've touched on a i think a key point and that's location 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 uh which is a very good segue into chalice and the Julamar project um Alex touched on uh, the Julemar project in his intro. Uh, what he didn't say was well, this is a project that's a stone's throw from Perth. Um, biggest PGE discovery, as you say, outside of South Africa any time recently. Um, but importantly, very close to a population centre. Uh, that location is great. Perhaps talk through that and the benefits, but then also the challenges that brings as well from a permitting perspective. Yeah, I think there's, a, there's clear benefits there. Obviously, the first being the obvious one, the access to labour. Um, Perth's a city of 2 million people. 
you know, it's got some of the, you know, the best technical professionals in the mining space anywhere in the world, you know, reside somewhere between 40 minutes and an hour and a half drive from our project. So that's a huge advantage for us, obviously low cost power. We're, we're very fortunate that there's a lot of natural gas in Western Australia, which has kept wholesale power prices sort of in the range of 50 to 80 um, dollars a megawatt hour. So that's a, that's a huge uh, advantage and it underpins a, an actual, you know, a sector that can grow off the base, off the back of, you know, low cost energy. It, it, you can't underestimate just the importance of, of low cost energy to do big scale, the meaningful scale projects in critical minerals are going to happen where there is low cost energy. No, no doubt about it. So, um, and then I think look, permitting on the other, on the flip side of that, and I think the government appreciates the advantages of Western Australia from those perspectives, but on the flip side of that, the, you know, social license, you know, permitting big greenfields, critical minerals projects is no doubt getting more challenging everywhere you go with the probably the, the sole exception of China and Indonesia. I think China and Indonesia are quite frankly putting the West to shame um, how quickly they can do things and scale up um, in particular laterite nickel um, is, a, is a classic example of that that industry has effectively popped up in Indonesia over the course of about seven years quite incredible so i think for the western world we've got this real dilemma is it is what's what's the better what's the the better of the two evils is it is it climate change or is it you know major large scale mining expansions and then you have obviously local local voices that that clash with you know global priorities and i think that is that is yet to be resolved in the in the space i think the government is acutely aware of the challenge but doesn't really have the answers yet quite frankly um but but what's clear is that yeah china just uh, you know operates in a different paradigm in relation to that they they just do not you know hold back anything of value of any industry it is basically exploited to its full and and i think you know if if that remains the case then obviously the West's competitive advantage in the space is quickly eroding. While I've got you, Alex, um, and it does talk to some of that funding availability, you've come out with a recent resource update um, and talked of the potential invitation of partners into the project. Uh, obviously the scale of your project invites that as well. Uh, Perhaps you can talk to that and I'll come to you other gentlemen as well on this one. It's uh, we've seen or heard about M&A occurring in the sector. We, we, we've had BHP present on their seeding program. Uh, how do you see that as a part of your growth trajectories? And perhaps start with you, Alex. Yeah, I think the first one is obviously, you know, it would have been hard to predict three years ago that the Australian government was willing to put taxpayer money directly into critical minerals projects. So, you know, that shows you the direction of travel for the, you know, the government as a partner, if you like, a funding partner. And then I think that you mentioned the IRA, that is no doubt changed the game for, for Western uh, car companies. Um, they, they have uh, obviously business models, which are necessitating huge amounts of expansion of lithium and nickel in particular, but also copper, graphite, all the other prerequisites for an, uh, electric vehicles. The IRA has totally changed the mentality of the of the particularly the North American car makers, but also the European car makers. Um, that that is necessitating a green premium for for Western product, which quite frankly there's not enough to go around. So if we the heavy lifting must lie with the explorers to actually find more metal in the Western world, and then we need to build projects much much faster. So I think we're, we're at a point where we have a very large discovery. So we're in a very fortunate space, but that comes with a level of capital investment. And, and obviously there's a lot of specialist capabilities which lie in much light, larger organizations than us. So I think we're, we're open arms to bring in car makers, uh, downstream parties, uh, mining houses to, to basically bring the best of the industry to, to come you know, jointly develop this asset. And Steve, obviously, you, you touched on it earlier. You have attracted Tesla as a as a customer. Um, how do you think about that conversation from a, from a mining company perspective? How best to structure that relationship, whether it's involved in the asset or the offtake or some other alternative? 
Yeah, it's um, we, we get asked that question a lot in the context of, of Tesla, but also other automakers and battery um, battery manufacturers as well. Um, got to remember from from a battery perspective and an, an incumbent automaker, they've got a, a lot of capital to be committed to build out battery and and change their manufacturing processes for EVs. Um, and one of the conversations we've we sort of had with both the US government but also you know customers is if you if if you provide us with a decent offtake, which is fixed price, volume, and quantity, um, we can get funding. Um, and and certainly, you know, US government funding that we've arranged comes at, at treasuries. Um, it's got an extended maturity and and is and is pretty attractive from that perspective. So we don't actually need their hard dollars. We just need them to commit to to take them take the material away and pay a decent price for it. Um, and that's been the, the structure of the conversations. But you know, who knows? We are starting to see. Um, people sort of move up the supply chain more to secure supply rather than making sure it kind of comes on stream and providing funding, but just to absolutely guarantee that they're going to be the ones to get it. It's a bit of an arms race, isn't it? Don't like to use that term, but yeah, <laughs> pretty much. JT, you're uh, in a not dissimilar position trying to attract uh, that capital to accelerate your expansion. Can you talk through decisions you've been going through there? Uh, yeah, we absolutely are sort of in that position now where we're, we're sort of pivoting from what is essentially a, a small scale facility to start to look out into larger scale production. We, so we have a we come at it from a very sort of non traditional position in that while we are going to be a lithium carbonate producer, um, we're not nearly at to the scale that a Tesla or specific auto manufacturers will come and say, we've got to go ahead and we've got to grab all of your, your production. Um, so we, from a commercial perspective, we come at it a little bit differently. We, we obviously lead with boric acid. Um, and, and while there's a, a fair amount of boron in EVs, it comes in the form more of acoustic thermal insulation, some of the polymers. So that becomes a bit more of a segmented market and where we're trying to sort of tie our production to government funding is to sort of attach to the less sexy components. So not the batteries, not necessarily the magnets, because it, you know you have different pieces that are assembled and, and you've got one producer of one part of the battery or the magnet that will manufacture one part and that's not a volume. So then we start to focus on, and we have a very public LOI with Corning, um, and Corning in the specialty glass space, you know, becomes a, a, a pretty big player. Um, there's also European glass makers that, so our, our conversations sort of don't follow the traditional route, but have similar blue chip players that, that ultimately were in structured conversations and negotiations with. Um, and then we sort of have that added twist that um, a lot of the same buyers of boric acid also, also come back and say, well, we do have some lithium consumption. So um, we lead with boric acid, non-traditional routes, but then sort of follow on with lithium. You might, I'm conscious of time. Aaron might finish up with your perspective on the M&A market, given you've obviously come from that background. Um, obviously, in the resources sector, it can be either an opportunity or a threat. Um, you have had the previous experience of building a company through M&A, and obviously that's part of the DNA of, of AIC. A lot of acronyms in there. Um, can you talk us through how you see your ability to grow AIC um, and perhaps how you also see that being, um, whether it's buying from big companies or hoovering up companies who can't fund their own growth, uh, and then perhaps even the, 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 the threats that big companies present to you if they've got a bigger checkbook? Yeah, look. <laughs> We just exactly ran out of time. I was going to say, with 10 seconds to go, I'll answer that question as quickly as I possibly can, as quickly as I possibly can. Or maybe I'll just say, I think M&A will explode you know, over the next couple of years. Are you that enough? No. Um, you know, the, and for, for some very good reason, uh, you know, and you know, Alex touched on it, you know, we're not finding, you know, some of these things quick enough. Um, the funding is not easy to do as a single asset company. The market wants more multi-asset, larger companies. So there, there's, you know, there's support. You know, the market desperately wants it. There's a reason to do M&A. You know, that's an age-old reason to diversify, to deliver reliable production and growth. That's the evolution story. It's exactly what we're trying to do at AIC. Um, whether we lead 
that that M&A or whether we participate in that M&A and how that M&A happens. I don't know. Will it happen? I guarantee it. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank the gentleman for uh, enlightening you on the decarbonisation journey we're on. I like the way, Aaron, you're so chatty now, and yet when you're up doing your presentation before, you, you were just so quiet, and yet here you're just like absolutely energised. I want to see more of that. I want to see more of that. Okay, guys, thank you so much. You enjoyed that conversation, everyone? Say yes. That is the correct and polite thing to do. Guys, if you can stay there, because I'm looking for my camera person. He usually likes to get a really nice group shot of you. So you stay there and look at my back for a moment. I'm not trying to be rude to face it to you. We've got one last session to go to round out this conference. And I can promise you we've got some really interesting uh, possibilities for you. We have got a graphite project that is absolutely one of a kind and could be in hot demand. We've got a mineral that's making our renewable power sources like our solar and our wind in a way so we don't have to renew them quite as many times. You know, if you build it, it's renewable. You shouldn't have to just rip it down. So there's a mineral that we're going to talk about there as well. Uh, we'll talk copper, we'll talk rare earths, we'll talk about a magnet recycling plant, which is all the way over in Ireland. And I mentioned rare earths. We've actually got a panel to wrap up the day. Now, I know we talked with Mike about it yesterday, but this is going to be a complete panel. And hopefully that'll give you a little bit more solid knowledge to base your investments on in that particular sector in the years to come. Enjoy your afternoon tea. We'll ring the bell and I look forward to seeing you all back here for the last session. Thank you, everyone.